Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Ingles on the Beat show. I'm Mike Griffith. I'm joined by special guest Chip Towers from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, my longtime friend. Uh, Chip, good to see you here tonight. Hope your uh, Monday's been productive. We had Kirby Smart a little bit earlier today. Did you get a lot out of that? I mean, it's been a tremendously productive day. If you think about it, you know, you had uh, Tennessee and the Vols uh, going with their Zoom call, their media conference at the exact same time. And and then Kirby, there was a lot to get to today, as you know. Uh, uh, I, I was glad that that we did that and kind of got most of the most of the stuff, uh, I'd say, uh, out of the way in the in the first few minutes of that, and then got down to the brass tacks of football. And um, yeah, I got a lot out of it. How about you? Yeah, I thought so. I thought it was interesting. Always interesting to hear what Kirby points out from his press conferences and his takes and. I think Kirby Smart's got to be happy to be 2-0 and with two different starting quarterbacks. I guess, what are your thoughts? I mean, a 37-10 to win over Arkansas, 27-6 to win over Auburn, Georgia, about where you thought it would be right now? You know, this will sound a little bit out of like a cop-out, but, man, I say this every single year. And, <laughs> and uh, Griff, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're both grizzled vets, right? You know, and it's like it takes a minute to be sure – what everything means in college football. And especially this year, you just, we, we think we know, but we really don't know. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, you have a general idea. Cause like, I mean, I mean, this past Saturday, I came out of it and I go, Hmm. I mean, maybe Arkansas's defense is a little better than we thought. Right. Uh, you know, no question. Juan Mathis did not play well in that opener or the offense in general as Kirby is, beat us over the head with since then, you know, it wasn't just one. It wasn't just one. It wasn't just one. And then, you know, flip side of that, uh, you know, you think, wow, they got some O-line issues and they come out and do what they did against Auburn. But here's what we still don't know. I mean, that Auburn defense, that could be a really bad defense. You know, when it's all said and done, we don't know. Uh, We think we know that they're pretty good, but we don't know. So, you know, so be it. So, to answer your question, I'm hemming and hawing here. You know, you're two and oh. This is where you expect the Georgia to be. Uh, that was the first test. This will be the bigger test, a bigger test. And then the one after that will be a lot bigger test. So, you know, we'll we'll I guarantee you we'll come out of those three weeks, these three weeks in a row, with a real good idea of what kind of year it's gonna be. Yeah, you know, Chip, I I, I still don't think we've really seen all of Georgia yet. I know we said these are all SEC games and, you know, you're going to have to put your best out there every time, but I still think this is a JT Daniels team. I I, I just think, you know, the Dwan Mathis story was good. You know, a guy comes back from brain surgery and, oh man, that's great. Now you got the whole walk-on story and Stetson Bennett and, and man, that's great too. But I just feel like when you get up against it, and maybe this could be the game when you get up against a guy like Jeremy Pruitt, that's going to scheme you up and, you start playing some teams with enough talent that are that's going to press this Georgia offense enough, you know, where arm strength is going to matter. I, my take, and, I, and I'll share it, I guess I want to get yours. I think we might see JT Daniels before the end of this next game. What, what are your thoughts on the quarterback situation? Well, we, we could. And, and I mean, I, I still think at this point, it's largely dependent on how the guys perform, you know, like how well Juan Mathis performed. I don't think we'd ever seen Stetson Bennett if Juan Mathis had come out there and perform the way they said he was performing in preseason camp. Now, normally you and I would have a stronger opinion ourselves of what they look like in camp and who they ought to be starting, but that's not the world we live in right now. So you just got to go by the, you know, sometimes it's propaganda or whatever the narrative that, that they're putting out. And, you know, the word about Dwan Mathis and, you know, at least the McGill donors got a good look at him in preseason camp was it that, that he had looked pretty good, but that just goes to show you the difference in scrimmages and then, you know, real competition. He didn't look so good. So to answer your question, yeah, I, th- I mean, I think it's absolutely possible to see JT Daniels in this game uh, or not. I mean, if, if, uh, and, and look, this is, it's really not a criticism of Kirby smart, but, I mean, I, I honestly, or Todd Munkin, but I honestly think, you know, ever since Jamie Newman opted out, they hadn't been sure. It's, and, and it's a tough situation. I mean, give them credit. I mean, you got JT Daniels. If you look at it just on paper, I mean, the guy's got 742 career snaps, 
12 starts at Southern Cal. He's six foot three, supposedly, and 210. Um, done some good work, former five-star. Heck, what are we talking about? What put him in there? But then there was the knee situation, you know, and and uh, how real imagined is it a is it all a ploy? You know, I don't know, but I, I don't think there's any doubt you got to get that guy out there and probably take a look at him at some point. And I'm sure that will be the case this Saturday if Stetson struggling. Now look, Jeremy Pruitt, he knows what he's doing on defense, and he's going, you know, he's gonna. Whatever it was, Georgia was going was doing well against Auburn. He will take that. He will make it a priority to take that away. So now what you got? And um, so so there's that. Here's the other thing that you mentioned at the beginning of this, and I'm sorry for rambling if I am. I'll no, it's good in a minute. But um, another thing about this this whole offense, if you look at it, it's oh I know what it was. I wanted to agree with you that we haven't seen. Right. And we, we barely scratched the surface on this offense, because the one thing about uh, the wide receivers beyond George Pickens and Kiaris Jackson is they they are still learning. You can tell there is a lot of misrun routes st- still. And you can see what they see in, in Burton and Rosemary, uh Jack Saint or uh, just Rosemary. Let's just go by that. <laughs> what it is. I'm with you, Jim. I knew him as Marcus <laughs> Rosemary. And, you know, I mean, both these guys were impressive individuals. But, look, there's something that any uh, college offense is that, you know, you got to line up and you got to determine whether they're in, in press, man, or zone, and you have to run your route accordingly. And, man, they were messing that up right and left. I mean, you can see he threw it out. He, went in. he threw it deep. He stopped short. He stopped short. He threw it deep. I mean, that's just – they're going to work that out eventually. The same thing with Kiaris Jackson. He he knows the difference. So, he's running right. the right route. And that's why he's getting open all over the place because Pickens <laughs> is getting all kinds of attention. Kiaris is just doing what he's taught to do. And then, you know, I, I don't know what Matt Landers is doing, but it's not what he needs to do. So, <laughs> so you know, they're, they'll, they'll, it'll get better anyway. No, I'm with you. And, and I think Kyrus is getting all the balls and the tight ends are getting all the ball because Stetson can't throw it deep and he can't throw the deep out to those perimeter receivers. And that's that to me is that's the, the next step that, you know, step one was going from Dwan. And, you know, here's the deal. When you're practicing chip, those quarterbacks aren't getting hit. That, yeah. That's the biggest difference. It's one thing when guys run by and touch you. It's amazing. You know, when quarterbacks start getting hit, the game changes. Let's be honest. Juan got lit up pretty good. You know, that offense, you had all those whistles, offsides, holding, plays negated, a lot of interruptions. You know, yeah. that can rattle anybody. And, you know, Georgia fans have been spoiled. And I know this is where I'm going to start getting some daggers when I start talking about what a good job that Jake Fromm did managing this team. We didn't see false starts. We didn't see delay a game. We didn't, you know, we saw a couple broken plays last year because of a young receiving core. But in 2018, when Jake had veterans, you didn't see too many guys running the wrong routes. You know, yeah. now you've got a lot of newness, like you said, incongruent. Yeah. And, and and that's why we think this young receiving core is going to grow because it is a brand new offense, to your point. Uh, so this is the toxic environment bowl. That's what I'm calling it this week. Uh, everybody's playing nice now. You know, Tennessee's not saying much more, you know, about Cade Mays. That's kind of died down. We'll have Jimmy Himes on later in the show. We'll revisit it. But we'll talk about it from our side, Chip. You know, Kirby said today he was shocked. He did not have any idea that Cade Mays was going to transfer away from Georgia. And, uh, you know, they started him January 1st in the Sugar Bowl. And, Kate announced he was going to leave a week later. Kirby just that just blindsided him. And and uh, matter of fact, it looks like we're going to have Jimmy join us here in a moment, and he's going to get to be a bigger part of the program than he realized. But uh, they, he was absolutely shocked by this. Uh, Chip, are, were you buying Kirby Smart being blindsided by the Cade Mays news? And welcome, Jimmy Himes. We'll get to you in just a minute and introduce you properly, sir. Go ahead, Chip. Um. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't buy that entirely. Uh, not that Kirby would lie or anything, but I'm sure he has a way to <laughs> rationalize it. But uh, you know, I mean, look, you know, the lawsuit and everything goes back. You know, the paperwork was filed in December, but there would have been um, behind the scenes, you know, stuff going on far before that. And then there was the whole recruitment of Cooper Mays, and uh, you know, Georgia wouldn't or didn't or couldn't or whatever offer him. 
uh, and all that stuff is going on. So I find it hard to believe that Sam Pittman leaves uh, what first first week of December, and uh, and then you start preparing for the Sugar Bowl. I, you know, I find it hard to believe there weren't some conversations there um, back and forth. But you know, however you want to play it, um, you know, one week. I mean, actually, it was one week after Georgia got back from the Sugar Bowl. Not only was Cade Mays in Knoxville, but I mean, he, he was enrolled. He was in school. I mean, it was like one day it was, uh, he's in the transfer portal and it was just like those Star Trek, old Star Trek. I mean, he just, he just materialized right there in a, in a Tennessee classroom, you know? So, yeah, I think everybody knew what was going on. It, you know, talking about the people at the very tip top of each pyramid, which would be uh, uh, Kirby and Jeremy and Kevin Mays and Cade Mays and Cooper Mays, they all knew, um, in, in my opinion. Well, guys, K- K- Kirby Smart said at the beginning of this season that the team that was able to adjust on the fly the best was going to be a champion. And tonight, we are going to adjust on the fly. The plan was to go first half with Chip Towers and second half with Jimmy Himes, who, who is the expert on Tennessee football. Believe me, I can tell you, uh, Jimmy, probably one of the most credible reporters in the country, does a great job. And Jimmy's going to join us for the second half. We're going to take our break right now. I want you all to pay close attention to this commercial for an angles. And when we come back, we're going to do this three-man show, the second half. I don't know how it's going to go. This is unprecedented, but we're going to adjust. Pay attention to this message from our sponsors at Ingles. It's in our hearts to feel for the real. There's been ups and downs, turnarounds, there's good days and some bad. But we stand together for worse and for better. We'll always have your back. Well, welcome back to the show. And we do appreciate Ingles. You know, we talk about how tough this COVID-19 period has been. And Ingles has been there certainly to help us get through it, you know, supplying us and making sure we've got all the goods we need. Jimmy, I want to welcome you on the show. I appreciate you joining us tonight on our Ingles on the Beach show. I'm keeping Chip. Chip thought he'd be done at eight. Now he realizes he's going to be stuck here <laughs> doing this three-man show. The rest of it. He's all right. We're, we're all a dog. We all work hard. Jimmy, what, what about this Tennessee uh, Cade Mays deal. We've seen it from the Georgia side. It seems like the, the headlines just keep coming. What about the effort that, that it took from Tennessee to keep this thing in the news? And do you give Tennessee credit for pushing Greg Sankey into this corner and getting this blanket waiver for all the inner conference transfers? I don't know that I would give Tennessee credit for putting Sankey in a corner. I think there was more than just Cade Mays. There was Joey Gatewood, there was Otis Reese. So I think it was a concerted effort by more than just Tennessee. Now, what the Mays family did when they got the initial denial from the NCAA was they hired an attorney, Greg Isaacs. So he kind of took over, formulated a plan, and he actually sent in a request for reconsideration <clears throat> to the NCAA. If that were denied, then you've left yourself room for an appeal. Well, he didn't have to make an appeal because they won the request for reconsideration. Now, I don't know everything that has come down with this situation. All I can tell you is that in talking to a variety of sources, uh, I was told that the position coach at at, uh, Georgia had told Kate Mays, hey, I'm sorry, we screwed you over. And then I was told that when the Mays has made visits to watch their son play while he was still at Georgia, Kirby Smart wouldn't talk to him. So that's the, quote, toxic environment. That's what um, more than one source told me. Uh, is that exactly what went down? I don't know. Uh, but I did talk to Greg Isaacs. I've talked to the family. I've talked to coaches at Tennessee and others. Uh, I don't know exactly what happened. But obviously, he wanted to get back to Tennessee. I'll tell you this. You know he was committed to Tennessee. And he said one reason he was going to Tennessee was he wanted to win a national championship. When he changed his mind, Tennessee was in the middle of an 0-8 SEC record, right? So – he told the Tennessee coaches and Pruitt and Jeremy Pruitt and Philip Fulmer, I'm going to Georgia because they got a chance to win a national championship. Tennessee does not. Now, I think the athletic director wasn't happy about that, but Kate Mays was right. Georgia was in position to do what Tennessee was not 
in position to do. That's why he changed his mind and he went to Georgia. Yeah, and you know, Cade Mays was a big part of a couple of top five seasons, and Chip and I saw this. He played all five line positions. He'd worked himself into the money-making spot at left tackle. That's why I guess I was caught a little off guard. You know, Jimmy, before you joined the show, I asked Chip about Georgia's start with the 37-10 to win over Arkansas and the 27-6 to win over Auburn. What about Tennessee's start? They went on the road and beat South Carolina and Columbia, kind of a coach's hot seat game, and then a real dominant effort against Missouri. Your thoughts on the Tennessee Vols right now, 2-0 and start? I thought in South Carolina, they just did what they had to do. They did not play great. Uh, they uh, made a few plays here and there. They had four pass plays of over 30, or at least 30 yards, so that was beneficial. They didn't run the ball as much in the first half as they needed to. They came out in the second half and established the line of scrimmage. Defensively, they didn't do a very good, good job on Shai Smith. Uh, he's their best player, and they put a freshman nickel back on him. One of the things, though, that Tennessee had to overcome, and I can't speak for everybody else in the SEC, I think Tennessee was hit harder by COVID than anybody else. And, and here's why I think that. Because not everybody's mentioned numbers, but here's what I think. Pruitt said they had a two-week period where at least 30 players were absent due to either testing positive or contact tracing or injury. So they had a scrimmage on a Saturday schedule. They didn't have a scrimmage. 34 players were out. On Monday, 57 players were out. Hit hardest by the COVID. I would say they were hit hardest by the COVID. Jimmy's locked up on us there, Chip. Of course, Georgia doesn't share the numbers with us. We did hear that early on there were seven Georgia players that gotten it. I think there was some deductive reasoning or mathematics done by the uh, Athens Banner Herald to get that number after a FOIA request. Georgia, of course, with some very uh, dark sunshine laws in respect to how long it takes to get the sort of information to sort through it. You listen to those numbers from Jimmy Himes uh, about Tennessee's numbers. Where do you think Georgia's, if we're going to ballpark and if they're not going to tell us, that means we get to guess in my book. That's fair is fair. We get to speculate. Where do you think Georgia's numbers lie on this? Well, first of all, I love your description there of dark sunshine laws. That's a good way to put it, dark sunshine. Or maybe we would just call them cloudy laws. Yeah, um, but, right. but, yeah. yeah, and a lot of, you know, a lot of readers don't understand why this is important for us to, to know, but it's, you know, it's, it's about public health and safety. It's, and people's right to know, you know, and public university and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I do believe, uh, and I have heard anecdotally and through sources and those kind of things that, that Georgia has done certainly comparatively well uh, against the virus. And, and you, you and I know uh, Ron Corson personally and by reputation, and, and that's not a surprise, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, he's whatever the latest is and they're going to be all over it and they're going to, and they're going to do it times two or, you know, whatever, whatever the protocols are, they're going to even be more rigid. That's, that's just pretty much the Georgia way. So I think they have done well, but they have not been on, scathed uh, about this I actually got the same information that Mark had and it was just it was just you know 90 days later and and it you know it, it just it's not as relevant I mean it, the, the their from their perspective that law works because it's just not as relevant uh you know more than it's it's a 90 day rule but it's actually more than 90 days because it's 90 business days so whatever that is uh, we should get some more information in November, as I understand it, um, <laughs> That's right. you know, but by then it, we'll be talking about what happened in, uh, you know, early in late August and early September. So, I mean, it is what it is, but I, I do think by and large, Georgia, for whatever reason, didn't have as many problems as some other places close by LSU had, a, a, a you know, a lot of cancellations. I didn't written about it lately, but there were, there were several F SEC schools that, you know, had to can't Auburn had to cancel uh, a couple of practices. You know, Georgia never had to cancel any practices, as far as we know. And now there have been some, so a couple of outages here in these first couple of games. You know, players not there or whatever. You're left to wonder. I wonder if that's COVID. You know, but we we won't know. Uh, you know, until we'll never know whether who the individuals are. And I'm okay with that. But how many? You know, you know that. It, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jimmy has a, a very specific number and. We have, we're not dealing with the same thing. No, we're not. As far as the amount of access to information that we have uh, via the Freedom of Information Act, again, laws in Georgia, different. One of the first things Kirby Smart did, Chip, 
when he became the head coach was was uh, work with the governor, I believe, to help get those laws similar to Alabama's in terms of how difficult it is to get public information at times. Guys, let me ask you, you know, we talk about both of these teams having COVID related issues. Jimmy, we, we haven't seen any SEC games canceled yet. We've seen some NFL games postponed. Uh, do you believe there's going to be some SEC games canceled still? Are you still, uh, or do you feel like that, that maybe we've passed that threshold and and, and teams have, have figured out maybe how to corral this with their testing. Canceled or postponed. I think one or both. I, I don't think as much as you think you've got a grip on this, as much as you think you have handled it, look at the Tennessee Titans. They just had 20 people in the organization. I think it was 11 players and they had to postpone a game. So as careful as they are in the NFL, and, and they don't have to deal with college campuses where you got co-eds and you got fraternity sororities. So I, I think that there will be some games postponed or canceled. They built in some open dates with the hope of playing any games that might have to be uh, that might have to be postponed. But I do think we will see that. I would be surprised if the SEC uh, escapes that. I, I'd be surprised if other conferences don't. We've already had what at least twelve to fifteen games postponed or canceled. Got one team that took them four shots before they played their season opener. So I think it's going to hit the SEC, and I do think there'll be either postponements or cancellations. What are your thoughts on that, Chip? So far, you mentioned how well Georgia's controlled this, and Ron Corson, uh, one of the most recognized sports information, or excuse me, one of the most recognized sports medicine directors in the Southeastern Conference. Is the clock running on Georgia right now, and are they at a disadvantage because they haven't had these widespread cases? that other teams have had and perhaps more immunity than a team like Tennessee that's had over 50 guys already test positive. And from what we know, that means that they should be immune from catching it again for at least another three to five months based on what the science and doctors are telling us right now. Well, obviously I don't know about Georgia specifically though. I do know for, you know, for three consecutive weeks, the university of Georgia has had decreases uh, in the numbers, but I got to be honest with you now seeing the scene around Athens this past weekend. And I don't know if it was just because of the game or what, but there were a lot of distressing signals. I mean, I'm, you know, uh, bourbon street bar there on Broad street, they're packed snake down the sidewalk, one next to another, next to another waiting to get in the bar. Uh, you know, if, if three of them had masks on, I'd be shocked. And there were a hundred of them in line, um, you know, the tailgates. And then during the game, George has got a little bit of criticism, but Hey, look, this is the law, you know, in the state, you you're you have to wear the mask when you come in to Sanford Stadium and as you make your way around, if you're going to the restroom, you're going to the concession stand, but once you're at your seat, you can take it off. And everybody took theirs off, and which is a little odd to me because what we know about the virus is one of the way it moves is is you know through in through the air. So when people are screaming, which is what they were doing, that's when the <laughs> virus is moving if you've got it and you can't be sure. If everybody doesn't have it and, you know, and the, the students in particular, which is not a surprise, you know, they ended up kind of congregating together and people, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's, there's some um, criticism about that. So to get to what you said, I, whether it's Georgia or somebody else, I agree completely with Jimmy. And I also give Greg Sankey and the SEC credit here because of the way they built the schedule allows really all these conferences. I mean, they knew what they were talking about, right? And they're like, yeah, there's bound, there's going to be one or two at least. And ho the, the hope is just it's not a massive thing, but all it takes is one. You know, hey, look, I've experienced in my own household. If anybody anywhere has had is exposed to contact tracing, then you have to be quarantined. That's, the, you know, it's sort of say it's the law. I guess it's not the law, but it's the, you know, it's the CDC recommendation and if so if you go by that as long as people are following the medical protocols and i have no reason to think anybody wouldn't um yep there, there'll be a cancellation whether it's georgia or somebody else or postponement is to jimmy's point because i mean i think they've built that in for for that possibility more than likely we'll see a game postponed made up later you know what i'm not so sure if i'm the sec right now that i worked that hard to postpone i just cancel and i'll tell you why because the Big Ten's sitting there with an eight-game schedule, yeah. and the Pac-12's coming in with a seven-game schedule. And if they're going to be eligible for the playoffs, then why in the heck is the SEC beating each other up for ten football games? I think I might just say, you know what, guys, let's just take it off. You know, 
that's a concern for me when I think about the college football playoff, Jimmy. When I look at how the SEC is playing this brutal, barbaric schedule, I go back two years ago. And Clemson fans, if you're watching, you're going to want to turn this off. But that Alabama team with, with Tua Tungvaloa would have beaten Clemson by three touchdowns in September, October. The one that lost in January when Tua was beat up, when two or three players were out of the lineup. Remember when Clemson was struggling with Texas A&M and barely beating Syracuse? I mean, I do. It's, it's kind of like NCAA basketball. College football is turning into a tournament sport, Jimmy. I don't know that I like that. What are your thoughts about the college football playoff and the fact that they're telling the Pac-12, yep, seven games is enough, and for the Big Ten, eight games is enough? Do you think that the college football playoff committee is going to take an undefeated uh, Big Ten team over maybe a second SEC team that has one loss? That's a hard question. Uh, I would like to. I would love to be on the college football committee because – I would vote based on a variety of things that I don't know that they'll consider. And I hope that they would. If you, even within the league, what if you've got a nine and one team and another team six and oh in the SEC? Which one of those teams represents the East or the West? So you've got that debate out there. Uh, I tell you what, if you're going to play six or seven games, if you're the Big Ten or the Pac 12, then you better win every game. You better be dominant. And don't come in and tell me, you know what, we just beat Illinois. And we just beat a, Indiana. We beat a couple of teams at Northwestern. We're very good. No, if you have not played a representative schedule, I don't care if you win every game by 30, you don't get in. Now, as far as the SEC, would I cancel a game? It depends on whether or not it's Vanderbilt or Alabama that I'm playing. Yeah. So that, that, that depends. If, I, if, it, if it's Alabama, I'm playing it, by golly. I'm not canceling that game. So, But I, I do think it's a hard decision. You're going to have to go a little bit by the eye test. You're also going to have to go by – what you see, uh, just how impressive a team is. You do have to consider, which is kind of your point, if you have a, an SEC schedule where you're playing like three or four ranked teams in a row, there's no way you can you could be at an optimum level for all of those. So I think you've got to take into consideration the possibility of the difficulty of the schedule in terms of what you're trying to determine as to who belongs in that college football playoff. But it's going to be a tough decision by those guys. Chip, we talk about the college football playoff committee. Uh, you know, I've made my feelings known about this. You've got a Florida guy on there. You've got a Georgia Tech guy on there. Uh, you got an Oklahoma guy on there. I kind of thought Georgia got the business in 2018. Uh, I remember the late Pat Dye talking to him, and his response was, well, hell yeah, Georgia Tech guy ain't going to put Georgia in there. Do you blame him? You think I ought to put Alabama in there? Uh, the answer is no, and I can't believe that the college football playoff uh, executive director acted like he was offended by the notion that a Florida and a Georgia Tech guy might keep Georgia out. I see the college football playoff committee chip. I think they've gotten political politically correct on us. I think it started out with four best, but now I think they want to spread the wealth. And with these TV markets, I mean, are there too many black helicopters in my world, Chip? Or do you have faith in this college football playoff committee? Well, I've, I've been too around too long to have a faith in any of these, uh, uh, setups, to be honest with you. And look, I, you know, I thought, uh, I really thought they would expand the field, right. Especially when this happened, it was announced that they would have fewer. I mean, I've always favored the 18, the 18 playoff just makes so much sense to me. You know, you got five power conferences, you got some, some little guys that deserve a shot. Uh, it, you, you know, you got more than one in the power conferences that probably deserve a shot. It makes perfect sense for me. And I thought, oh, what a perfect time, you know, COVID to bring that in uh, because you don't have equal footing. Normally, at least you have 12 games in the conference championship. We finally got there, uh, which puts everybody on the level playing field. Well, there's no level playing field this year. And so, uh, I mean, it's going to be what it's going to be. There's going to be an asterisk next to 2020, no matter what happens going forward. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and I, whether we like it or not, I don't know. And, you know, to Jimmy's point, dog, and I couldn't help but chuckle when you're talking about, uh, uh, cancellations, just, just cancel them. You know, I, I, you know, if George is going to be sick, you know, I mean, you can't make that trip to Tuscaloosa, but you make the other, you make all the <laughs> other nine games. Hey, I'm sorry. This is the way it worked out. We had an outbreak. What, what can you do? You know, if you were dishonest about this, I suppose you got to show the actual test or something. I don't know. I haven't gotten down in the weeds about that. It'll be, it'll be three months down the road before I found out what criteria they were using anyway. So 
Doesn't That's matter. right. Yeah, we don't have the transitive properties. We don't have the the conferences playing other conferences to really be able to judge, you yeah. know, where the conference strength. No, we all know. I mean, it's common sense. The SEC has more guys in the NFL, more guys drafted. They've what had 15 teams in the last 14 national championship. And, and yet, and still, they play this game that Oklahoma – again, you're, I'm going down that road. I don't want to go there. All right, guys, we've told everybody to get off our lawn for the last 20 minutes. Let's talk about the Georgia-Tennessee football game. Jimmy, I want you to give me your picture of Tennessee offense on the field versus the Georgia defense. What do you see? What are the keys for the Vols to be able to move the ball against this Georgia defense? I think this is the best offensive line I have seen at Tennessee since probably 2012. The 2012 offensive line had four guys that played in the NFL. One was a first-round draft pick. A fifth would have played in the NFL if he didn't have bad knees. This is the best offensive line I've seen since then. This is a much more physical offensive line as well. The Butch Jones offensive lines were push, shove, get in the way, zone read. This is not. They fire out. So I think that Tennessee is going to have to do a pretty good job of neutralizing Georgia's defensive front. And, oh, by the way, ask Auburn how hard that is. What, 29 carries, 39 yards? They are tough. I think Georgia probably has the best defense in the country, not just the SEC, but the country. So Tennessee's going to have to neutralize it. They've got to have some semblance of a running game. I put out the number of 125 yards rushing. If they don't get that, they're in trouble because they do not want to put all of this – on the shoulders of Jared Gantano. Even though he has played better and mistake-free the first two games, I still need to see him do it against a quality opponent. And so if you're asking him to throw 40 to 45 passes a game, you're asking for trouble. That's why they've got to be able to run the ball and be able to get into a play-action situation. If they can't, then they may suffer the same fate as Auburn and kick two field goals. Yeah. Chip, we got a lot. We got to see a lot of that Georgia defense now. I think we were all a little stunned when Arkansas had that 91-yard drive, the second series of the season. You had to think that the old pit boss had a few tricks up his sleeve and set up that scissors route, that 49-yard touchdown. Richie LeCount, Rat Trap Richie, got caught with his eyes in the backfield. Kirby used to call him Rat Trap Richie yeah, because yeah. it plays just <laughs> like that. Yeah. And so we saw that breakdown. Now, they did, now, Auburn was not able to get in the end zone. Uh, Chip, do you think Tennessee is going to be able to get in the end zone against Georgia? And how many points are they going to need to score against this Georgia defense to have a chance of winning? Well, this is exactly why you show up and watch them. This is why, you know, CBS was interested in carrying the game. I, I mean, uh, that, you know, that uh, battle uh, of wits is going to be fantastic to watch. And I mean, I've been just uh, – I really have been mesmerized by Georgia's defense. It's really, really impressive what they've done. And when you think about it, you're saying how many points is it going to take to win. Now, you think about this for a second. This defense, which is pretty much back, I mean, I think it's 37 players back. Thirty. I think it may be 36 after Devon Wilson left, are back to play 100 or more snaps on last year's defense. That defense gave up over 20 points – one time to a generational LSU offense led by the number one draft pick and a, you know, a bunch of other dudes. Right. Um, so, um, I mean, it's pretty amazing. And then uh, yeah, there was the breakdown against Arkansas and look, that's always going to happen. There's going to be a, a busted coverage. I mean, it's just, it's just the price to it, especially when you have an all American uh, or all American potential, like Richard LeCount, those kind of guys, they're going to peak a little bit. They're going to they're going to cheat a little bit. That's how you make big plays. I mean, the biggest the biggest peaker and cheater there ever was at Georgia was Scott Warner. He'll tell you now. You know, he he kind of figures it out. You know, and and you know sometimes that'll burn you, but sometimes it'll also result in you know a pick six or what have you. So, um, and and I was so impressed with I've been so impressed this year with the havoc they've been able to create. That havoc that we've heard about so much. That's coming to fruition right now. I, I don't think I've ever seen a bunch of edge rushers in on one team. I know I haven't at Georgia, as they have right now. And you you combine that with the interior play of not just Jordan Davis, who gets all the pub, but Devontae White's a guy, uh, you know, that's – you know, he may be in there more downs than Jordan Davis is. I mean, they got some serious stuff going on. So, I, I'm that's why we're showing up. I'm excited to see that matchup. 
And what I'm not sure about really is, and maybe maybe Jimmy can fill us in on this a little bit, is, is Tennessee's defense. I feel like I just don't know as much about them on that side of the ball. I just don't have a strong feeling. Uh, and I, I think special teams have been a little bit of an issue with the ball so far. Um, they haven't been great. Georgia's have been great. I've been, except for the missed field goal this past week, um, Georgia's have been exceptional under Scott Cochran and what we've seen so far. Um, so I really don't know about those aspects of Tennessee. And, you know, a lot of times that's where it gets decided. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling 13-17 somehow. I just, you know, uh, something at a turnover and deep in the territory, a special teams play that gets Tennessee. I, I, Jim Chaney is just a guy that, you know, he's been around the block a few times. I, I think he knows how to scheme. I think he knows Kirby's philosophy. I think he knows this George defense probably about as well as anybody, Jimmy, because most of these guys have been here since Jim was here. I mean, this is a, a very salty, very veteran group. So let's go ahead and spin it around. Like I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put 13 to 17 on the board for the balls here. Let's spin it around and talk about this Tennessee defense. I see DeAndre Johnson, the you know, former defensive end from Miami, a kid that got stabbed in high school, lucky to be alive. Now he leads the SEC in sacks. I like this kid. Good guy. Uh, the, the Toto kid from California. Uh, he's, he's a generational talent, it appears. He's doing amazing things. What does the Tennessee defense look like? And how many points do you think George is going to be able to put on them based on what you've seen from Georgia with Stetson Bennett under center? I think Georgia will score 24 to 27 points. I think it'll be similar to – I don't know that Tennessee's defense is any better than Auburn's. I think Tennessee's run defense is decent. Uh, they don't have any stars up there, but they have a lot of guys that are, are pretty good players. DeAndre Johnson has sort of filled the role of Daryl Taylor. Daryl Taylor had eight and a half sacks last year. Johnson has picked up there with two and a half so far. He, he's impressed me. He really hadn't done anything until this year. He's now a senior. I think Henry Toho Toho at, at the inside linebacker is an all-SEC, maybe a, an all-American player down the road. Uh, the linebackers next to him, Quaverius Crouch, Jeremy Banks, they're decent against the run, not very good in pass coverage. Kavon Bennett on the other side, that's Cornelius' son. He's a pretty decent pass rusher. He's average against the run. Tennessee's problem right now has been the secondary. They've had so many people that have been out in the secondary that they have tried to move all these folks around. Heck, they played Bryce Thompson, the best cover corner at safety against South Carolina. Jalen McCullough's been out. Theo Jackson's been out. Uh, uh, the best nickelback, Sean uh, Schamberger, has not played yet. I think it's COVID-related. Now, when I say COVID-related, that could be contact tracing, not necessarily that he had it, the virus, right? So they, they have been a work in progress back there. I think there are holes in that secondary. Missouri dropped some passes on them. Otherwise, the defensive numbers wouldn't have looked as good. I think Georgia is going to be able to pop some big plays on them. I think Pickens is tremendous. Uh, Stetson uh, Bennett played better against Auburn than I thought he would. I, I was impressed. I thought he did a nice job running the show. So I've actually picked uh, Georgia 24 to 13 over Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, that sounds about right, Chip. You know, we were talking early before Jimmy Jones' show, and I, you know, I, I think JT Daniels is going to play. Now, maybe, you know, after listening to Jimmy, maybe it's not out of need. Maybe it's not out of necessity. But I sure think you need him to beat Alabama. I don't want to get too far ahead here, but we are going to talk about Alabama before I let you guys go tonight. I don't know how we can do a, a show without talking about Nick Saban. I mean, there's got to be some rule about that. But, but Chip, what about this offense? And what about, you know, based on what you're hearing from Jimmy, your thoughts on the Georgia offense? Because Stetson Bennett, his numbers weren't incredible, but he was very efficient on third down, even with the limitations and the limited arm strength. Your thoughts on Stetson Bennett and how you're seeing this play out as we have this conversation on Eagles on the Beat. Well, I love his story, you know, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, we're all storytellers, all of us here. And, and uh, I love his story. You know, it's all, it's always fun to write the guy that walks on earns scholarship, uh, whether he had to leave and come back or what have you in Stetson's case. And, and he has impressed me. He's shown me uh, really what we first heard about it back in 2017, you know, it was Mel Tucker who first uttered those words about Stetson Bennett running the uh, Georgia scout team as Georgia prepared for Oklahoma and, and talking about Baker Mayfield, he said, well, if, if, if he's, uh, if he's as good as Stetson Bennett, we're, we're in trouble. And 
because Stetson Bennett was was giving them fits uh, as with the scout offense. Uh, who was Malik Herring? I think today said Stetson Bennett on the scout team one day went twenty for twenty against Georgia's defense. <laughs> so it's it's. I mean, I don't know if that's true, but you know, if he did, it's pretty incredible. And uh, so all that to say, I, I've been impressed with Stetson. Now that said, you know, there's a reason why when you're under six feet uh, and, and, you know, we saw him throw the deep ball this past weekend, uh, was it 49 yards to Kiaris Jackson? And he had to yeah. stop, they had to hold up. He was open enough. He had to hold up to catch the ball. I don't know if that's all he's got or if he has more, but you know, that's the, that's the pass that Todd Munkin has come here to create for Georgia. And that's why Georgia's looking at six foot six, 210 pound, uh, Dwan Mathis, who's the fastest with the strongest arm, that's why they wanted to start him. That's what they wanted to see. And uh, they weren't able to get that, uh, uh, you know, out of Stetson Bennett. But you got a lot of other things, right? You got him the right play, and you, and he showed some elusiveness. So I, I think JT Daniels, you got to get him into the act. He didn't transfer here from Southern Cal, sit out all year. I mean, that's bottom line. And, you know, who probably had more to do with him being here than anybody? Todd Munkin. So, you know, I think we'll see something from him, whether it's this game or whether it's only if Stetson Bennett gets in trouble, we'll have to find out. Hey, I hate to cut out on you, but I've got, I've actually got a, somebody else is about to call me here. I got another show to do. Uh, it's Georgia, Tennessee week. So I got to You're cut busy, guy, Chip. You know. You're busy. Hey, listen, before you go, I just want to thank you. And Jimmy, I'll get to you in a second. These guys, I've known Jimmy and Chip since 1994, and this has been so much fun to get to do a show with both of them. I used to edit their copy for a magazine in 94, story for another day, but I've known both these guys a long time, and let me tell you, they're, they're two of the absolute best in college football, and I'm so, I'm so glad that I was able to do a show with both of them. Chip, thanks for joining us. Talk to you tomorrow, uh, both Mike and Jimmy. See you. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Jimmy, let's move forward here. I, you know, we're, we're wrapping it up right now, and it certainly looks like Georgia and Alabama and Florida look like the three favorites. Are you buying or selling on Florida right now? Your thoughts on the Gators through the first two games? I'm buying their offense. I'm impressed. <laughs> I, I thought Kyle Trask was the best returning quarterback in the SEC. He's got an incredible talent to throw to in Kyle Pitts. So you got Trask with 10 touchdown passes. Pitts has caught six of them. Uh, what they did to Ole Miss, I thought, okay, I know Ole Miss's defense isn't all that good, but then they chopped up South Carolina as well. I, I think their offense is, I'm going to say borderline elite because I don't know if they're that good at running the football, but I think they're very good throwing the football. And I think Trask is, is outstanding. So I, I'm buying in on their offense. Their defense still has to prove it to me, but I think their offense uh, is, is exceptional. What about Alabama? You know, Alabama's lost two out of the last three years to Auburn, didn't even finish in the top 10 last year. Is this a bounce back year for the Tide? Are you expecting Alabama to win the West? And if not, and even if so, who is the biggest threat in the West division to Alabama right now? I like Alabama. I think they bounce back. I like Mac Jones. When he took over last season, it wasn't just that he had some good game. I think he put up some big numbers against Auburn. And then I think he did against Michigan in a bowl game. Now, it helps to have a great receiving core, right? He's got that. He's got arguably the best running back in the league in Najee Harris. He's got a really good offensive line. So he's got the supporting cash. But I, I look at a very confident, accurate passer. He knows what he's doing. I think he's really good. I think Alabama's defense is going to be better also. I think that they incurred so many injuries last year that it impacted their ability to be a great defense. They got Dylan Moses back, who's one of the best linebackers in the league. Uh, they've got two outstanding cornerbacks. Uh, their defensive line is solid. I, I think this is a very good Alabama team. Who's going to challenge them in the West? Nobody. That's my thought on yeah. that. LSU's not yeah. good enough. I thought LSU was overrated going in. Mississippi State's not going to do it. <laughs> so, and then I don't think A&M's that good. And, and I think Auburn is – uh, is handcuffed a little bit offensively by their offensive line. I don't think anybody can compete with Alabama in the West. Yeah, I think you're right, Jimmy. Obviously, they dominated Texas A&M. I mean, I, Jimbo Fisher, I mean, is he, is he going to get it done? I mean, this was the $70 million contract. Are we starting to look – is this the beginning of the end for Jimbo? Is it too early to say that? 
I think it's too early to say that. Uh, but I tell you what, eight, you didn't pay him, what, $7.5 million a year to go eight and four. Now, obviously, they're only playing 10 games. I get that. But you fired Kevin Sumlin for winning an average of eight games his last five years. That's not why he was brought there. He was brought there to win the West. Now, that's difficult to do when you got Alabama sitting there or you have this LSU team, which was a phenomenal team a year ago. But, yeah, he's got to step up and start winning some big ball games. And there's no reason not to. you got all the resources in the world. You've got an incredible recruiting base in your backyard. This is my opinion, and I may be proven wrong, but I think he's being held back a little bit because I think Kellen Mond's a bit overrated. I don't mm-hmm. think he's that good. And I had an SEC coach that told me, he said, you know, when you play against him, he's a tremendous athlete. He can make a lot of plays. But if you give him 60 plays in a game, 50 of them are good, and 10 he's going to screw up. And he said he's going to make enough mistakes to mess up that team. And I kind of think that. I, I You saw him make some plays against Alabama, but he can't do it on a consistent basis, in my opinion, against good teams. I think that's going to hold A&M back. I think they, get, they better get an elite quarterback in there if they want to become an elite team. Jimmy, last question for you. You know, you and I covered Tennessee together for years and years. And, you know, our sub story – and I'm going to go ahead and tell it because it's my show. So I'm going to tell the story. I would have not been covering Tennessee if not for Jimmy Himes. Jimmy was the Tennessee beat writer when I was covering Alabama. Well, there was a guy named Mike Keith that held Jimmy's job as the lead sports radio guy in Knoxville. It's a great position. Jimmy's on radio every day, four hours on WNML. He does television shows. He still writes. I mean, it's a multimedia spot. When the guy that was in Jimmy's chair went to do the Titans radio, Jimmy left for that job and I had to fill Jimmy's shoes. And as I would tell Jimmy, Jimmy, it was hard filling your shoes when you were still in them. He was still in town breaking all the news and I'm the new guy. So I had about five years of chasing Jimmy on that beat. Thank goodness I don't have to chase anymore. And I get to work with him on shows like this. But as far as the, the, the Tennessee coach, and we know that Philip Fulmer has said this and Doug Dickey used to tell Philip this. And now Philip has told Jeremy Pruitt this. And Tennessee's won eight in a row. But is that that trio challenge still hanging there? Because they always say a Tennessee coach is judged by what they do against Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. And Jeremy hasn't beaten those teams. Is that still hanging there? Or are these Tennessee fans fired up right now and all in on Jeremy Pruitt? Uh, they're fired up and they're, <clears throat> they're all in. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so Tennessee's won eight in a row. Uh, and they've won six consecutive SEC games. They like two things <clears throat> about what uh, Pruitt has done. One, he's recruited extremely well. And um, so he's, he's – that's – obviously, you got to do that if you want to win at this level. The other thing is <clears> – <throat> excuse me – he's brought a toughness to this program. It's a toughness that you didn't have under Butch Jones. Uh, Derek Dooley was an awful – Lane Kiffin wasn't here long enough. But he has brought a toughness that folks like. And if you want to beat the Floridas, the Georgias, and the Alabamas, you better be able to neutralize them at the line of scrimmage. And Tennessee's going in that direction. When he got here, the offensive line sucked. Now <clears throat> it's one of the two best, two or three best offensive lines in the league. They've got four five-star recruits on that line. So there's no reason that they shouldn't be good. And I think they are good. Games like Georgia determine whether you're great. But the the fan base is all behind him. They like what he's doing. They like the direction he's going. But sooner or later, he's going to have to get over the hump and beat Florida and beat Georgia and occasionally knock off Alabama. Uh, Is he ready to do that this year? I'm not sure. The thing to me that's the biggest question mark about how high this team can go is what they get out of the quarterback. I'm, I'm a big believer, and you, you've got to get high-level quarterback play to win at a high level. Uh, LSU did it with Burrow last year. Alabama's done it with Tunga Below and others. That, to me, the uh, fate of Jeremy Pruitt rests with the quarterback play over the next three or four years. Because if it's not better than what Garantano's giving you, <clears throat> you're an eight or nine win team. If you get – if Caden Salter's really good or Harrison Bailey's really good or somebody comes in here and becomes uh, an elite-type quarterback or an all-SEC caliber quarterback, 
then Tennessee's off and running. But if they don't get that, Mike, I think they can be really good, but not great. Jimmy would know. He authored a book on Peyton Manning, by the way, uh, among many other things that he's done in Knoxville. And, and again, you can catch Jimmy on WNML. Uh, if you want great breakdown on this game, he's going to be talking about it every day this week at three o'clock on WNML. You guys can Google it. They live stream, does a fabulous job on the radio show, a great author and a great friend. Jimmy, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciated your analysis. I miss working with you up there in Knoxville, man. This was a lot of fun tonight. I appreciate it. Thank, thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. You bet. Jimmy Himes. So there was Jimmy. We had Chip Towers at the start of the show. Jimmy just wrapped up his segment. I'll give you my closing thoughts. I'm going to take a look at some of your comments here. Uh, appreciate you folks that have been patient with me. I think you were a little bit nicer to Jimmy and Chip than you were the Auburn beat writer last week. So that's a good start. <laughs> Yeah, they can get rough here, Jimmy. I can tell you that. I'm seeing some Georgia fans comment. Here's my thing about Jeremy Pruitt, guys. I think Jeremy Pruitt is going to be able to push Stetson Bennett into some places that he doesn't want to go. Specifically, I think he's going to be able to close off the middle of the field and force Stetson to have to make those deep throws and throw those deep outs. And that's a very difficult throw for somebody who doesn't have good arm strength. That's where you see those interceptions and turnovers occur. And that's my theme and my narrative this week. And that's why I think you'll see JT Daniels is I think Jeremy Pruitt's going to sit back and look at what Auburn did and said, wow, look at this. They played too deep. They never really challenged them. And Jeremy's saying, look, we didn't come here to play this one close. We came here to win it. So I think they're going to be very aggressive on defense and challenge Stetson Bennett to make those deep throws and find those perimeter receivers. Um, I think that could open up some explosive plays for Georgia. But I also think that that could put Stetson Bennett and Georgia in a susceptible position because the Georgia offensive line has not gelled yet. Look at this. Someone commenting, Graham Nicholson talking about it, uh, you know, mentions George Pickens. Only two catches for George Pickens. Need more from George Pickens. You know, the running game. What are we going to see there? Zamir White showed us some flash, but still only 4.9 yards per carry. Hasn't broke that 20-yard run. Need to see that explosivity out of the offense. Listen, folks, I have had a great time tonight. It was such a joy for me to have my, my buddies Chip Towers and Jimmy Himes, two guys that I really respect, go way back with. I hope you enjoyed their commentary. Truly, two of the best in the business. Uh, I want you guys to have a safe week. You know we're going to have it stacked up on Dog Nation. You know, we're going to have Connor Riley tomorrow night doing his show, Jeff Centel Wednesday night, Thursday night we've got our cover four. And then there's Friday night, Mike and Brandon Adams every day at 10 o'clock on Dog Nation Daily. So everyone have a wonderful night. Be safe. Look forward to seeing you later again this week. If you got questions, put them in here in the comments. I'll circle back around and get them. Thanks for joining me on Angles on the Beat. <laughs>